Blessed art thou among them. Blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins. Now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit may be truly wise, and never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. St. Joseph. Father Terry. St. Nasha Loyola. St. Albert. All God's angels and saints. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Our Lord said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and decays destroy and thieves break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor decay destroys nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is also your heart. The lamp of the body is the eye. Your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. Gospel of the Lord. Eric is passing out the sheets I'd like to make. Um, it's a brief, uh, brief commentary on some saints. The saint that we celebrate today, uh, his name is Saint Albert the Great. Um, I think he's very often I think he's interesting to see how God allows uh, saints to sometimes be present in clusters or groups. Um, in that time, you've got about 10 great saints living at the same time. What if you know them? I'll, I'll go through the list. That time you got about uh, a big no number of saints living at the same time. This is the uh, around the year 1200. You have Saint Dominic of Guzman, and Saint Dominic founded the order of preachers. We call them the, the Dominicans. We have uh, the saint that we celebrate today, St. Albert the Great, who was uh, one, of the, one of the greatest minds in the world. Dominic was a Spaniard. Albert the Great, Albert was actually a German. At the same time, you have the student of Albert the Great, his name is Thomas Aquinas. You've heard of him, right? Yeah. So he's a student of Albert the Great, one forming another to become a saint. Then you've got the patron of lawyers, canon lawyers, going to live to be a centenarian. He's going to live to be more than 100 years old. He would be? Who's a patient of lawyers, Elvira? San Raimondo Peñaforte. St. Raymond, okay? Got a church not too far away. Huh? St. Raymond of Peñaforte was a Spaniard who was a lawyer. He made a mistake and he went in a religious life to offer it reparation for his Peccadello, which was something very small, and went on to live 
more than 100 years of age, a patron of kind of lawyers. And when he start, when he's 60 years old, he starts his preaching career until he's about 100. No? Pray for me that I'll be able to do that. <laughs> God wants me to live those years, no? Usually people were dead and buried when they were 40, and they could live almost triple those years, no? In, in, in the 13th century, no? What do all of those have in common? They're Dominicans. Okay, they're Dominicans, okay? They're in the order of Saint Dominic, okay? They all live at the same time. Then we have, at the same time, we have St. Francis. Did you know that? No, Padre. St. Francis is living at the same time as St. Dominic. And St. Francis is going to have a companion from Assisi, and her name is St. Clair, right? And from St. Francis is going to surface one of the greatest preachers in the Catholic Church. He's going to die in his mid-30s. He's known as the Hammer of the Heretics. His name is St. Anthony of Padua. Do you know that? No, Padre. And who is the saint that's going to take over the place of St. Francis when he dies? There we go. It's está fingiendo ignorancia, no? <laughs> okay, it's uh, Saint Bonaventure. Okay. He's living at the same time. And when he when he's born, per, according to tradition, Francis was there, and he it looked like he was going to have a, a lot of problems in birth. And Francis says, Bonaventura, which means good luck. His name is Saint Bonaventure. Learned something new today, didn't you? You have all those saints there living at the same time. All of you are called to become saints. Amen or oh me? Yeah, well, what will happen if the 50 of us become saints, huh? You know, quad, uh, quadruple the number, huh? But there's, a, but there's a cluster of saints that live at the same time. How about in the 16th century? We got John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. And you've got Charles Borromeo, St. Pius V, and you've got St. Camillus de Lelis, and you've got um, St. Uh, John of Avila, St. Peter of Alcantara. You've got St. Felix Cantalicio, St. Andrew Avellino, and you've got Juan Diego. You've got 10 Ten of those saints living at the same time. You know why? Because there were tough times. And there were tough times God will raise up great saints. Are we going through, th through tough times? Yeah. You have to become a great saint. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Some of you are looking at me and say, me, Father? <laughs> <laughs> like the painting of Caravaggio when Paul, uh, Jesus is calling Matthew, you, me? <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> All right, so there we have a little intro to our conversation this evening. Um, so uh, Mary's internet broke down, so she's able to make some copies from the computer. We only have one number left on the other sheets, so we'll finish that and move into others. We're on number 176, right? right. Si, Padre. Yeah. 176. 
That follows 175 if you're following me. Okay? Okay, resolution. Well, let's talk about the word resolution. Can I? Yeah. All right. Talk about that one word. According to Francis de Sales, at your end of your holy hour, it's a good idea to make a concrete resolution. I like that. Have you ever done that? I have. Not always, but maybe I'll go back to that. No? You make your holy hour, the Holy Spirit inspires you to carry the resolution. Do it. Right, Dana? Good idea? If, you know, you're talking to the Lord for an hour, you know, he's going to give you some light to maybe carry out some good inspiration. Do it then. Okay, when you go to confession, is it a good idea to have a good re resolution? Hello? Yes. Yeah, maybe to avoid a near occasion of sin. That should be part of your resolution. Have you ever gone on retreat or will you, go, will, or will you be going on retreat? Hello? Hello. Okay, well, you, you, you've made the eight-day retreat with me, many of you more than once, right? When you're finishing a retreat, you should make a resolution. You should hammer out for yourself a plan of life. Is there any priest you know that wrote a book on plan of life? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> He's just using my book for a doorstop? Come on. <laughs> That's the insult. You just put your mug of coffee on top of my book. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So what is my book is designed to make resolutions, right? So the word resolution, you, you thought I was just going to skip over that word, didn't you? Well, I didn't. Make good resolutions and carry them out. We have a New York expression. The highway to hell is paved by many good resolutions that you don't carry out. So you got the resolutions. Try to carry them out. It's just pine the sky idealism, but try to carry them out. And beg for the grace. Amen? Beg for the grace. Okay, resolution. Set next, faithfulness to inner inspirations. Are you reading? Faithfulness to inner inspirations. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you right now a list of inner inspirations that. Um, a highly refined spiritual group like yourselves might receive. How about that for a compliment, huh? Thank you, Father. Are <laughs> you listening? Yes. One inspiration might be, okay, lengthen your holy hour a little bit. Right, Madina? Yeah. Okay. Instead of an hour, 65 minutes. And if you have the, the thought, if you, if you have the thought to turn your hour into 55 minutes, that comes from the devil. <laughs> yeah, shorten it, no. Yeah. A little bit longer. You're getting a rubber band. Elastic, huh? Another might be this. Practice some type of penance. It can be a million things. Self-denial, mortification. 
really following the Lord, the Holy Spirit moves us to deny ourselves. Okay? There you are, grabbing onto the fifth cho chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> oh, you, did it happen today? Okay, well, you know, I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay, another one might be this. Maybe God is moving you to pray one more rosary a day. You're praying one, you might be motivated to pray two. Eric and Mary, and is Lupe Galvan here? When we went to Yorba Linda, what did we do when we were driving there? Lupe? What did we do? Prayed one, one rosary? Three or four. How many, Mary? Four. Three or four. We prayed three or four rosaries. So, yeah, good. As soon as we got in the car, usually Eric was driving, no? Have to admit, sometimes I would doze off a little bit, right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Not that much. I didn't snore though, did I? No. <laughs> because Eric drives so well. It's such a peaceful <laughs> drive, you know. <laughs> you know the story of the. Uh, you ever hear the story of the? Um, there's this priest that goes to heaven, and Saint Peter says, "Okay, you've got that little place there. Just a little corn. You barely made it to heaven." And then the priest is complaining because he looked up, but way up there was a New York taxi cab driver, the checker cab. You ever been in New York, the checker, no? And the priest is saying, you know, Peter, that's wrong. I should be out there. I'm a priest. He was just a taxi cabber in New York, no? Come on, I should be out there. I should be out there. Peter said, uh-uh. Why not, the priest says. He said, because every time you open up your mouth in Mass, you would put the people to sleep. <laughs> but every time anyone got into the cab with that, tech, that cab driver in New York, he'd pull out his rosary. Like that one, Grace? Yeah. I thought you'd like it, huh? I like it. Our founder says we should aim high. He says he, he was happy to have <laughs> a little cottage or casita, and a little, a little house in heaven. We'll probably have a palace in hell. So we should aim high, right? Aim high. <clears throat> So the Holy Spirit might inspire you to say an extra rosary. Might inspire you also to um, humble yourself in one way or another. humble yourself, to make some act of humility. That can be thousands of things. We grow in humility by practicing accepting humiliations. Right, Jaime? Even though it's hard, we know, we know that the royal path to, the royal path to humility is through humiliations. And I'll give you a suggestion, you're, you're, you're probably not going to like this, but I'll, I'll tell it anyway. Do you like it when people correct you? <coughs> you love that, don't you? No? <laughs> when someone corrects you, smile at the person and say, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I was, I was waiting for that. 
you know, there's some correction. Maybe the person's right. Maybe he's right. And because of our pride, we bristle and we, we reject it. It's hard. Hmm? But how else are we going to grow? The people who are married, don't you love it when your spouse corrects you? <laughs> Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> Alma, Raquel, it's hard. Alvira, it's hard. It's really hard when someone corrects us. No? But God allows that to happen to keep us humble. Hmm? Right, Astrid? Yeah, God allows to keep us humble. Some of you are smiling. You're saying, I have no problem. I have no problem whatsoever to have my spouse correct me because I don't have a spouse, okay? <laughs> Eric, Dana. <laughs> So be faithful to inspirate. There can be a million different inspirations, but we want to we want to be open to them. You know, often it's going against the grain, you know, doing what we don't really want to do. Going against the grain. One more. When someone cuts you off in traffic, ever happen? May God bless you. Have you ever done that? May God bless you the way you're going, you're, you're, you're going so fast. I hope you'll speed on the highway to heaven. No? <laughs> <laughs> the, way, the way you're going the freeway, 92 miles per hour. I hope you'll move, move just as fast on the highway to heaven. <laughs> See, a person has goodwill is able to interpret everything in a positive light, right? <laughs> So whenever anyone gets in the car with me, they pray the rosary too, right? <laughs> Everything, ever since Lupe started to drive with me in my missions, she's got more gray hair, right, Lupe? <laughs> she's actually turning white, huh? <laughs> Okay, then, even though I, I would have no idea how much I would have to pay for it, I must do nothing on my own without first consulting the confessor. Hmm? Saying right there is, um, it's good to follow inspirations, but when you're doing your, you're carrying out your um, work under obedience, it has more, more merit, more value. Theologically, when I obey my superior, there's actually more merit to it. Okay? When you make vows, no? So you obey, God through your provincial, your rector major, your superior, there's actually more, more merit for those who profess vows. No? And I think it's, you know, I think it's easier to know the will of God as a religious than as a lay person. I really do. And lay people, it's not always clear what is, right Dana? Not always clear. But our will is, is, is manifested through our constitutions, our rules, our, our superior, our, um, our plan of life, no? 
For example, this week, Father Larry gave me the 6 o'clock Mass in the morning. Uh, I was grunting a little bit inside. <laughs> It, no, it's not. It's not. It's not that. Uh, just that that's usually when I'm doing my holy hour. No? But was able to do it. Was able to get maybe 56 minutes in afterward. It was almost an hour. If I can count my Thanksgiving after mass, it was an hour then. Okay. <laughs> but it's beautiful if you know you know what God's will is and you carry it out. There's a lot of peace, right? A lot of peace, but if you don't know, is this God's will or not? You're always living in turmoil. No? You're living in turmoil. Okay, so that's uh, number 176. I think 177 follows if my mathematic is not faulty, right? Do you have 177? And what we have now is Faustine is a religious. She has already made her vows, chastity, poverty, and obedience, right? Yes. And she's renewing them. In uh, many congregations, you make your vows, you renew them one year, two years, and three years, and then you make what are called perpetual vows. Perpetual vows means that you belong to that community for the rest of your life. So that's, uh, sometimes it might be a fourth year, but usually it's about three years. Make the vows. So if, uh, say for example, uh, a, a, a girl goes into the the Carmelites were your sisters. She made vows for one year. She still can leave. Okay? And it's not a sin. Uh, those years are sometimes years of, of probation to see whether or not. But after they've arrived at their perpetual vows, uh, you're part of that family until the end of your life. Renewal of vows. So that's where we're heading in this number. Renewal of vows. From the moment I woke up in the morning, my spirit was totally submerged in God. In that ocean of love. How beautiful. So when you're doing your holy hour, you really experience as if you're just submerged in the love of God totally? Not really, no. We haven't arrived at that yet, have we? Maybe one day. Maybe one day we'll arrive at that. You know, you're praying, and you're just keenly aware of how much God loves you. And you're just allowing that, allowing the Holy Spirit to just embrace you with his love. And you're basking in that. I pray that you experience that once. Amen? Amen. You know, submerged in, in God. And it's an ocean of love. I like that image. An ocean, that's a lot, isn't it? I felt that I had been completely immersed in him. During Holy Mass, my love for him reached a peak of intensity. Does that make any sense? really feel it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you really want to experience the love of God, in Mass, after Holy Communion, you have God within you. You have the sacred heart of Jesus beating within your heart. So 
that reason, those, those minutes after Holy Communion are the most important minutes of your day. Allow God to love you, you love him back. Maybe God is challenging us to be more uh, recollected and more concentrated in those key moments when we're receiving Holy Communion. And to close our eyes and to just tell the Lord how much we love him. Let him love us. Those are the most important minutes of, of our day. After the renewal of vows, and it's interesting, the renewal of vows is in the context of the Mass. I see a, I, I see a real uh, logic in that, because to live out the vows, we have to have God's grace. How, how was great God's grace communicated to us, especially through the sacraments? And the greatest of all sacraments is the Eucharist. So after the renewal of the vows in the Holy Communion, I suddenly saw the Lord Jesus who said to me with great kindness, my daughter, look at my merciful heart. Do all of you have in your home, you have div the divine mercy image? Yes. Yes. Do all of you have the sacred heart? Yes. What's the difference between the sacred heart and divine mercy with respect to the heart? There's a difference, isn't there? The divine mercy, the divine mercy image, the heart is within. It was a sacred heart, and this comes from St. Margaret Mary Ella Cook, is that the heart is outside the body. When I make my monthly day of retreat, I try to make my monthly day of the first Monday of the month, I try to get my four meditations in, in my room, I have, two, uh, I have two big paintings of the Sacred Heart. I'll often place that in front of me when I'm doing my meditation. It really helps. I've got two different ones. How can it, how can it not help you? You have got the image of the Sacred Heart. You see the Sacred Heart, it's... Um, it's big, it's uh, surrounded by light on the cross. You might see one where there, there's a cross over it. Uh, in surrounding the Sacred Heart of Jesus, you, sometimes you'll see it, you'll actually see thorns, and you'll see, uh, you'll see drops of blood and you'll see the Sacred Heart that has a wound. How could you, how could you look at that and nothing happened? So right now I'm teaching, I'm going to teach you another way that can enrich your prayer life. Contemplating beautiful Catholic art. Contemplating beautiful Catholic art is a means by which we can arrive at what the art represents, which is God himself. As spiritual director and confessor, people will, you know, we've got some directors here. Uh, did, did anyone ever at, bring this up in direction? 
Mary, Eric, or Dina, I get distracted? Not yet? I think that that's probably one of the most, most common things that comes up. See, all of them? Yeah, I, I would be, almost be surprised that after, after two meetings, someone didn't say, I get distracted. No. And I think you have to give a response to that. What are you going to do? Well, it would be some moral problem, maybe go to confession. Maybe you're distracted because you're tired, get to bed on time. Right? Could be the devil that's trying to pull you off course. He's present there too. But I often suggest if someone is distracted, even during the rosary, make sure you, if you're praying in your home, have a big graphic image of Mary or the Sacred Heart. You think Ignatius would suggest that? Power of the image, right? So the use of images is very efficacious if we use them properly. Images. Even at work, at your workplace, having a an image of Jesus or Mary can help you think about God during your work. Right? The boss says, you shouldn't have that in the workplace. If you work in St. Peter's now, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> My daughter, look at my merciful heart. Here's a challenging question. Are you listening? The people that surround you, could they say that you have a merciful heart? Hello? Good question, huh? I think I'm reading your mind. Avesis. Maybe sometimes, huh? <laughs> well, if we're followers of Christ, shouldn't we try to imitate Christ and be merciful? We should aim at that, right? And to be merciful doesn't mean that you, 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 you know, just jettison or chuck out the window being just. Justice is a, is a virtue too, right? I think in our in our lead there has to be a harmonious blend between mercy and justice. A harmonious blend or integration between the two. But I think mercy should dominate the justice. Amen. As I fix my gaze on the most sacred heart, it doesn't say it, but probably, probably in the convent there, there's a big, beautiful picture of the sacred heart in where she's making her, renewing her vows. No? This, the same rays of light as are represented in the image as blood and water came forth from it. And I understood how great is the Lord's mercy. So you have the you have the, the, the blood and water coming forth from the divine image, right? But if you look closely at most of the image of the Sacred Heart, Going back to St. Margaret Mary, I'll look closer. You're going to see drops of blood, drops of water, too. And they're symbolic of baptism, confession, and the Eucharist, those three sacraments. Baptism, confession, 
and the Holy Eucharist. And I understood how great is the Lord's mercy. And again, Jesus said to me, with kindness. Is kindness important? Is it? Is it easy? Not always. Not, it's not always easy to be kind, is it? Sometimes, sometimes it's hard. Probably when you're tired, right? Kind of frustrated, things are not going well. Maybe you're in desolation. You don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be kind. No. Maybe I mentioned this years ago, but there's a wonderful book uh, written by Father Lavasic on the Eucharist. He's written books also on the saints, but he wrote a book called Kindness. Yeah, the title is Kindness, Sophia Press. Any of you ever hear of it? No? It's called Kindness. Uh, uh, L Father Lawrence Lovasic, L-O-V-A-S-I-K. Have you ever seen those little catechism books, the picture catechism books? They're done by him also. Father Lavasic. What he does is he he goes through all the different ways that we can be kind. Uh, kind in our words, kind in our writing, kind in our gestures. Kind, about ten different chapters on different ways that we can be kind. Kind in our speech. It must have been about 1983. I was in Rome, and um, Father Greg Staub was a deacon. And uh, the, our, our, our rector allowed the deacons to preach in Mass on Sunday, and I think his group, he was with Father Dave Keeter and Father John Lyons, they were companions. I was two years behind them. So you're able to preach, if you're a deacon for nine months, you probably preach in the, in the Saturday evening mass, maybe eight times before you're ordained. And one Sunday, the priests at breakfast, they were talking about Father Greg Stobbs' homily, that really, Moved them and and moved uh, and moved the uh, the people, and it was taken from the book on kindness. And this was the this is what he did. He took he took a, like a couple of pages on kindness, and he turned that into the homily. Can I give you a summary of the homily? So this was about thirty five years ago. So my memory is pretty good, but not perfect. It might be. Fit missing a word or two. And it was the whole idea of kindness in words, and how, how words have to be kind, but also words can, can really do damage. And it's the story of a, of a woman who lived a really bad life, a pretty scandalous life, and she was a Catholic, and um, she moved from one city to the next. It was actually, she moved from Chicago to Los Angeles. And she had undergone a conversion. So when she comes to LA, she's going through a conversion and she's participating in the mass and she's um, incorporated herself into a parish and She's uh, getting to know the people. She's gotten to know the pastor. And uh, she wants to offer her services to the parish. And, and she was a, a musician. So she offered her services as, a, um, as an organist. Played the organ, maybe the piano too. And the people really liked her. 
He was just a charming personality, a great musician. The people just really liked this, this lady from Chicago who's come to incorporate herself into Los Angeles. And what happened was someone who lived in Chicago moved to Los Angeles to the same parish where this girl was. And all of a sudden she saw her plan to get and she was scandalized. So she started to spread gossip, slander, detraction. Do you know what detraction is, any of you? Detraction is you might, you're telling the truth, but you're, you're saying, you don't have to be telling the truth, but you're saying something bad against the person. So, in a relatively short time, the people turned a cold shoulder to this girl. And it gets even worse that they ignore her. And she can't understand why is everyone that had such high esteem of, uh, of her presence. Now they just reject her. They see her, they turn a cold shoulder, they ignore her, don't even greet her. So she asked the pastor, what's happened? And the pastor says, well, a good number of people in the community, um, someone came from where you used to be and told about your scandalous life, and now they don't want you to they don't want you to um, serve, they don't want you to be in the parish anymore. So the girl gave in to despair and she threw herself off a bridge and she killed herself. In the book, the girl's name was Sylvia, the story of Sylvia. No? So she was killed by the tongue of this woman. Character assassination, no? slander, calumny, detraction. So that chapter, he gave a homily on that, and I think the people were, were dumbstruck by, what, by the, story. the story. It's a great story. No? And I'll use it usually once a year in one of my homilies when I can fit it in. No? Helps us, hey, think before you speak, huh? Golden rule. Say to others what you want them to say to you. And you see how this woman was merciless, not merciful. Do you know what merciless means? What? No mercy. So it's the exact opposite of mercy. Instead of showing compassion, love, and forgiveness, she would not forgive this woman because of her past. Typical hypocrite, right? Pharisee. Whoever is without sin, throw the first stone. We all have our own checkered pasts, huh? We all have our, our past histories which were maybe not very pretty, huh? But think about how often we failed the Lord, how many times he's forgiven us. St. Augustine says the, the more we judge and condemn people, the less we examine our own consciences. Huh? The more we condemn others, the less we examine our own conscience. Did you ever do this? You know, I, you know, if you do that, if you, if you do that gesture at me, you're pointing one finger at me, but you're pointing three fingers at your own heart. <laughs> I like that. So before waiting to be judge and condemn someone else, examine your own conscience. Maybe there's something in your life you have, we've got to change. So we, get it. we have to work on... Uh, Work on kindness, not being merciless, but abundant in mercy. Amen? Amen. The next is a great number 
I have to underline it and I have to try to memorize it, huh? And again, Jesus said to me with kindness, my daughter, speak to, who's that? Who who are those people? (laughs) Speak to priests about the inconceivable mercy of mine. Flames of mercy are burning me. Clamoring to be spent. I want to keep pouring them out upon souls. Souls just don't want to believe in my goodness. There's a lot there, huh? I think all of you have to pray for priests. Have you ever done that? Yes. Pray for priests. Pray for priests, but also pray that priests will read this. Priests will read this that priests will understand this message. And the priests uh, will put this into practice. You know, talking a little bit with with a couple of friends on the the movie of um, Faustina. Any of you see it? Yeah. A good I'd say maybe 20% of the movie was not so much on Faustina, but Father Michael Sapochko, right? And what what impressed me most about him uh, was how much he suffered, wow. How much he suffered you don't forget, here's the, t- here's the time block. Faustina is going to die in 1938. Father Michael Sapocha is going to die in 1975. How's your math? Almost 40 years later, 30, 37, 38 years later, he's going to be living another life almost. And his whole mission, he feels his mission is to implement, to put into life, into practice, what Faustina received from Christ. So he died in 1975. And it seems to be that at the end of his life, he seemed almost as if his work was a dismal failure. This is 75. Don't forget, John Paul II is not going to become a pre, and not going to become Pope until 1978, right? So, uh, John Paul II, he's not, he's still Bishop of Krakow. But his name is Blessed Michael Sapochko. What does that teach us? is that we're not always going to see the results of our good actions. We like to, right? Hello? We, we like to see re- results of our good actions. But it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't always happen that way. <clears throat> Being the son of a father that was that worked on Wall Street, I mean, kind of in our in our blood. Okay, you got a plan. Okay, you got a plan there. You got these are the steps you have to implement, and then the plan is completed. Let's move on to another one. I think we're all built. In, that's kind of built into the American way of life, right? It's not always the way that God works, though. Sometimes God works by the way of the crossword what might appear to be an apparent failure 
in the eyes of the world is real success in the eyes of God. Best example, the cross. That seemed to be a dismal failure. But Jesus saved the world through the cross. Now I'll give you a verse that, that, that will encourage us. St. Paul's letter to the, to the Corinthians. He says, I planted... You know the verse? Renee? I planted, Paolo watered, but it's the Holy Spirit that gives the growth. It's a very encouraging verse. We got to plant, we got to water, let the Holy Spirit bring forth the growth. Even in you know the, the ten week spiritual lecture, I said like to, I like all those people that finish the ten week program to want to become great saints. It doesn't always happen that way. I'd like it to be that way. But it's not always that way. We have to plant. We have to water. We have to pray. Practice sacrifice. Offer prayers and intentions. And let the Holy Spirit do his work. When all is said and done, he's the, he's the sanctifier, right? Amen. Sanctifier me. He's the one that makes us holy. Very difficult. We, 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 we want to see results. No? And we want to see them quickly. No? As the Mexicans say, ahorita, right? Right now. Ahorita. Isn't it interesting that Jesus spent 30 years in his private life, right? Three years in his public life and three hours on the cross saving us. Interesting, no? 30, 3, and 3. Suddenly Jesus disappeared. But throughout the whole day, my spirit remained immersed in God's tangible presence. Despite the buzz and chatter that usually follow a retreat, I did not dis it did not disturb me in the least. My spirit was in God, although externally I took part in the con conversation and even went to visit Dirty. So I think the last point that God wants us to listen to and to assimilate is praying for the grace of recollection, to be aware of God's presence in our lives. None of us are contemplative monks, but there's no reason why we can't be more and more aware of God's presence in our lives. God is everywhere. As Paul quotes, in him we live and move and have our being. So let's turn to these great saints that we mentioned, St. Albert, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis, St. Anthony, St. Raymond of Penafort, all these great saints that lived at the same time, that all of us would take seriously our pursuit of holiness. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners. The Lord be with you. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, Lord. Spirit. God bless you and see you.